Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for, for coming today. Um, I'm going to talk about open source hardware, but I'm also going to talk about open source software and how the two are linked. Um, my background is in open source software, operating systems, hardware. Um, for those of you who remember a long time ago in the UK, um, I actually founded a company called Tadpole Technology that built the world's first mobile workstations. So we built Sun workstations in a, in a notebook. Uh, they got very hot. We had to put them, we had to bond the processor to magnesium casing to distribute the heat. Um, for the last eight years, I've been CEO of Lenaro. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Lenaro, it's the company that enables the ARM ecosystem to work together on collaboration on open source technology for the ARM architecture. Um, so I am very interested uh, moving forward to see what is happening in um, both x86, ARM, and RISC-V, and I'll talk a little bit about this in my talk. So what am I going to cover? Um, firstly, talk a little bit about industry instruction set architectures. Um, talk a little bit about RISC-V cores um, and make the point that a core is not an SOC. A core is a core. You need a lot of peripherals around it to actually build a complete computer or chip. I'm going to talk a little bit about how important software-driven design is for customizable hardware and some of the challenges that I see that the RISC-V ecosystem faces and talk a little bit about use cases and security. How do we actually get RISC-V devices into the real world? Where are they already and what's needed to get them further? Um, and I'm then going to talk a little bit about what my new company is doing, which is uh, called Foundries.io, where we're developing open source platforms uh, that run across industry architectures and including support for RISC-V. And I'm going to take my life into my hands and do a actual live demo of uh, Linux running um, on a RISC-V emulator uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, so let's start. Um, so Intel and ARM are the two most widely deployed uh, instruction set architectures in the world. You'll be familiar with Intel x86 family, um, and I think most of the audience will be very familiar with ARM as well. Between those two companies and architectures, um, there is domination today of the world market for high-performance computing, data center computing, desktops, IoT, embedded computing, pretty much everything. There are some other architectures. You think about Spark, you think about PowerPC, but these two architectures are, have been dominant over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and now we have RISC-V. So RISC-V is a relatively new open source instruction set architecture. Think of it as a new version of x86 or ARM. Um, interestingly, it spans, it, it has the possibility of spanning the entire computing marketplace from tiny microcontrollers up to high performance computing and data center computing. So word widths are defined 32, 64, and even 128 bit. Um, Today, 32-bit is used for microcontroller and embedded kind of applications, typically, uh, and 64-bit is typically being used for Linux-type applications. Okay, so RISC-V SOCs. Um, the benefit of RISC-V is that it's open source hardware. There is no license needed to get access to the RTL, to get access to the design of the, of the core. Um, and if you go and look at the list uh, that um, uh, Bill talked about um, in terms of the RISC-V Foundation website, you find a number of cores are already available. Some of them are completely open source. You can download them on GitHub. Some of them are licensed, uh, so from companies like sci -Fi. And some companies have a combination of open source and uh, licensed. But of course, a core is just that. It's not an SOC. So a system on chip, a chip that you tend to actually build and put onto a board and make it do something, has a microprocessor core and then a range of peripherals around it. And microcontrollers tend to be relatively simple. 
They tend to have a UART, some GPIOs, um, possibly a USB port is pretty complex, and some of them now, you're getting more and more complex microcontrollers that actually have little graphics chips on. Typically, a microcontroller does not have an MMU. It's not always, but generally, microcontrollers either execute loops or small RTOSs. Uh, for, and are used for things like real-time operating systems, light bulbs, uh, safety-based systems, and so on. Security is becoming increasingly important for microcontrollers. The interesting thing about RISC-V is that initially it's being used for these relatively simple embedded tasks, and I'll come back to why later. But more advanced applications need a lot of additional complex IP. Uh, and as we were talking about earlier, um, some of this is very complex and is licensed, um, and it's going to take a long time to have open source versions. So if you think about GPUs, USB 3 is a pretty complex protocol stack. PCIe has taken many years to iron the bugs out of, uh, particularly it was originally developed obviously in the x86 world, and it's now fully available for the ARM world, but it's licensed from companies like Synopsys. Um, today, AI engines, neural processing units, again, IP. This, I think, will you will see open source hardware available for these kind of engines from various companies and universities and so on. And then hardware security elements. There's an increasing use of um, hardware security elements to do things like store public, public keys and private keys away from the chip, from the, from the main core, so that they're protected. Um, and also to do things like cryptographic operations in hardware, because some of the modern cryptographic operations are getting pretty heavy, particularly for small microcontroller type devices. So there are many hardware IP suppliers. Um, to build an SOC, but you may have to pay quite a lot of money to actually build a complete SOC around RISC-V. The great thing about the Chips Alliance, which Zvonimir has, has just talked about, is that the goal of that alliance is to make more of this IP available in the open for people to actually build more interesting chips from. It's going to take time. Um, and software has to be a major consideration. You might get the hardware for free, but if the software isn't open source, you're going to have a major maintenance issue because the supplier of the IP may not keep the software up to date with upstream, with the latest kernels. So you need to watch out. The cheapest hardware IP is not necessarily going to get you an open source product. Okay, so there's a picture on the screen of an iceberg here. Why? Um, so the benefits of RISC-V, no license fees, no royalties for the core. And so in theory, this is going to drive innovation through openness. Um, innovation can occur both in the open, in universities, academic organizations, things like the Chips Alliance, um, but also can happen, of course, through proprietary IP, right? You can start up a company, build some IP, so I guarantee you, if you had a company that had a perfect PCIe design, a lot of people would want to buy it from you, right? Because that's very valuable in the industry and would be a perfect complement to a RISC-V core. The other thing about the RISC-V architecture is you can extend it. You can change it to meet your use case. You can add custom features. Absolutely wonderful, but uh, there is nine, eight ninths or whatever it is of an iceberg waiting. We can see at the top this, this sort of wonderful world of, of RISC-V and um, hardware that you can design yourself, but the challenge is software. So fragmentation is a danger because what will happen if we're not careful is that People will design amazing complex hardware, and then you will need new tools, new operating systems rebuilt to work on that hardware. So if I've created a wonderful RISC-V chip with a whole bunch of new technology that's in nobody else's chip, 
I can get it to run software, but that software won't necessarily run on everybody else's risk buyer chip. So we need to be very careful about interoperability and not create or try and create multiple ecosystems because that will delay the market take up of risk five potentially indefinitely. So software ecosystems take many years to develop. It's not just basic tools. Today we have the basic tools for risk five. We have compilers, we have debuggers, um, we have key language support, uh, not all of it, right? So there's many languages, things like Java with its JIT compilers. Um, there is uh, porting of JVMs needed. There's a lot of optimization work needed. And all of these tools at the moment are pretty primitive. They have not been subjected to years of performance and optimization. It's going to take time. The good news is that you're building on two successful architectures already, right? We're building on the success of not only x86 in the open source world, but also the reference of ARM, where there are multiple vendors building ARM devices, and there's been a lot of optimization for ARM, which can then be relearned and reused for RISC-V. But the challenge is that development and optimization takes years, not months, even with very talented people. And as an example, um, I'll give you the ARM software ecosystem. Um, about five years ago, seven years ago, ARM introduced 64-bit architecture, um, which was built on a dominant position in the 32-bit world and introduced 64-bit architecture to the ARM, to the ARM uh, ISA. And even then, with um, extensive cross-industry participation, it took five years for ARM to actually be successful in producing and, and enabling uh, data center penetration. Actually running, um, for example, Red Hat on ARM, you can go in today, get a uh, instance of ARM running on a, a processor instance from Amazon. That took five years of industry participation from many, many companies working together. And so the point I'm making here is that software fragmentation is actually the Achilles heel of a modifiable architecture. And RISC-V is the most modifiable architecture we've ever seen. So the first comment is that the success of new hardware features is always software dependent. And I'm going to give uh, some lessons here that, that we've learned from looking at the rise and rise of machine learning and AI. So if you know about AI and, and machine learning, there are frameworks which were originally developed as cloud frameworks running on big performance computers uh, from Google and Amazon and Facebook and others, so things like TensorFlow and Cafe. And these frameworks were optimized for machine learning and they executed on x86 because that's what the data center servers were. And NVIDIA invested in also getting support for CUDA, which was basically um, NVIDIA's proprietary way of getting at the GPU. Because GPUs are very good at doing machine learning algorithms. Um, now you're seeing GPUs, neural processor units, AI accelerators proliferating. There are a large number of companies, startups um, and established companies building their own NPU architecture. Um, and in order to get these products to market fast, what are a lot of these companies doing? Well, they're not CUDA compliant. They're not x86 compliant. So what they're doing is they're taking TensorFlow Cafe and so on and writing their own backend for now, effectively, that's creating a fork. So that's a bunch of technical debt that you've then got to maintain moving forward because as TensorFlow and Cafe move forward, everybody's got to build their own and keep that moving forward as well. That's hard and it's expensive. So it's a good example of fragmentation causing substantial market delays and costs. How do you address this? You have to create APIs and common design specifications to 
abstract the hardware changes from the software layers. And so in the case of AI um, and machine learning, something like Onyx, which is an exchange format for describing hardware to the machine learning graph. So frameworks, if a framework supports Onyx, what it can then do is if the hardware, as the hardware describes itself to the API, if the hardware can perform that element of the graph, the software will do it in hardware, and if it can't, then the software will, will do it as a backup. So that's a typical example of how to do this right, as opposed to forking the frameworks, which is not the right way of doing this. Okay, so how does this um, also work in the rest of the industry? Well, some of you will have noticed that ARM have recently introduced for the first time the ability to do some custom instructions. So this is an interesting um, development. Um, and what it enables is customers who license ARM chips um, to actually design their own instructions into the chip, initially on microcontrollers. And so this is a recent public announcement um, it's been acknowledged in terms of that announcement that tools are a big challenge and ARM are introducing software tools to carefully manage the use of these custom instructions. Indeed, they've actually commented that often they feel that these custom instructions will primarily be used through called libraries. Because what you don't want to have to do is recompile the kernel to take, up, to take, better, to take the benefit of your new custom instruction because then you've got a fork of the kernel, which you've got to manage. So we have to avoid per device customized tools, kernels, languages, because one, it's too expensive to build and maintain for any but the biggest companies. And secondly, you're building a completely separate ecosystem and you're, and you're basically causing fragmentation. So the interesting thing about RISC-V is that there is no Intel or ARM. There's no kind of single company who's managing this process. ARM has tens, if not hundreds, of licensees who work together, but ARM actually control the architecture. With RISC-V, the RISC-V Foundation controls the core ISA, the core instruction set architecture. And you can only use the RISC-V trademark if you build a RISC-V processor core that meets those specifications. But as we've said, you can go and extend that in any way you want. And so industry collaboration is needed to prevent these fragmentation issues. Um, and the gold rush in RISC-V is a serious challenge because the gold rush says, I'm going to design it. I haven't got time to get this stuff upstream. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get my product to market because that's how I'm going to get paid. And therefore I'm going to have to do this myself. And that is not a recipe for scaling out in the industry. So let's switch for a moment and talk a little bit about use cases for RISC-V. So um, one use case that's relatively early uh, and, and um, Svonomir uh, works for Western Digital who announced that they're using RISC-V cores in, in disk drives today. Um, and so it's relatively easy because it's, it's in a microcontroller, it's self-contained, it's not connected to the internet. You can actually have total control of the software and hardware. It's an ideal use case today for RISC-V. Um, but once you start looking at bigger markets and connected computing, um, you have increasing device complexity and you need global, scalable software ecosystems. So for things like IoT, where you've got billions of sensors and endpoints, edge, gateways, hubs, automotive infrastructure, uh, and then of course, server and high performance computing. So here's the challenge. In the data center, a binary distribution image works on pretty much every vendor server platform on the planet. You can go and get Red Hat as a binary and it will run on any server, any Intel based server or AMD based server. There's an ARM version for running on any ARM server, right? 
it's a single source code base that you can deliver security fixes and updates. That's how Facebook and Google and the stock market keep going. They're all running on Linux, and as security problems are found, remember Meltdown, Spectre, they can be fixed in one place and they scale out immediately to the entire industry. That's how we keep servers going. But embedded products are snowflakes. Everyone is different. Every product has its own firmware and actually forked Linux kernels from the vendors of the chips. There isn't an embedded binary distribution that runs on all products. And in reality, there can't be. There are too many use cases, right? You've got everything from a small, small smart device up to a fully autonomous car. They're completely different. You couldn't run the same binary in both cases. And so what does the industry do? It has to create DIY distributions for every product. As a result, we have a major security problem because some people are very good at developing secure software. Most people don't have the expertise or they don't have time. And we have a pretty insecure internet of things uh, in the world today. There is no ability to scale. Okay, so how do we scale security? So my new company is actually trying to address this problem uh, in an open source way. Um, today, we've spent the last two years delivering an open Linux-based platform for IoT and Edge products uh, that is compatible across architecture. So this is x86, ARM, and RISC-V, and that can securely deliver continuous updates across a range of hardware and IoT use cases. We call this the micro-platform. Um, it's an upstream aligned, tested, open source Linux, and also there's RTOS platforms using Zephyr, which is another Linux foundation project. Think of it as sort of the, um, the RTOS of, uh, the Linux of RTOSes. Um, spanning multiple ISAs built from a single source tree. And these build in best of class security over the air updates from scratch and an optional Docker container runtime for the Linux implementation. They're maintained by us as open source projects. We welcome contributions from the users and the community, and you can go and get them from, from GitHub and you can read the documentation. Um, all completely free. But remember what I said, it's kind of difficult to build a binary for every use case, right? You can't do it. So what do we do? So what we've created is a service that configures the Linux micro platform, this open source product, to your hardware use case. You can add your own IP and your value add and your application. You can continuously build, integrate, and test, and then you can deliver updates over the air from firmware to application. And as a result, you can secure the maintenance of your product over its entire lifetime, as long as you keep your IP up to date as well. Um, and so the benefits of this are you can modify this Linux platform for your own product. You can add your own IP services and applications. You can add your own tests. You can provision devices. And then you can use fleet management or your choice of public or private cloud provider, so Microsoft or Amazon or Google. And you can install and run incremental updates to the firmware, operating system, kernel, or applications and you can leverage this single source code base as the starting point, which means that you can use more of your resource on your, your own value add and IP, and less trying to manage your core, and effectively manage your own distribution. So where does this come in handy with RISC-V? Well, core support exists today for the Zephyr RTOS, for Linux, and for a number of other open source and proprietary OSs. People have got a number of pieces of software running on RISC-V. The software ecosystem is still in its very early stages. There are many gaps. Most of the software that exists is not fully optimized yet. And there are gaps in things like Golang for building Docker. You, you can't run Docker yet. It's close, some enthusiasts and some, some, some 
members of the ecosystem have sort of nearly got it working or demonstrated it as a prototype, but it's not upstream quality yet. The market opportunity is very large. As I said, Risk Five can accelerate innovation. And actually, you can make it even more interesting because FPGAs and the ability to build a Risk Five core in an FPGA enables rapid experimentation and validation of customization before you commit to actually building a chip, which is kind of expensive. It may be free to get the RTL, it's not free to build the chip. Um, so how do we prevent, how do we prevent in the risk five world software fragmentation? The solution is to work upstream. The solution is to work in open source projects and to prioritize upstream support for all risk five projects. If you're building something on risk five, work upstream, work in the community, keep your own IP, but make sure support for the technology that you're building is available so that people can build on it and the ecosystem gets bigger and everybody benefits. Avoid forks of core platform technologies and tools. Forks are expensive to maintain and they're effectively creating fragmentation. They're also creating technical debt. You are going to have a very expensive proposition managing your own forks of things like Linux, tools, tool chains. <laughs> so working upstream is hard to do, um, but it's time and it's also time consuming. It's not just a technical problem, it's a social problem, but it is worth the effort. It requires industry and community collaboration. But if you can achieve it, then the ecosystem can grow and we can harness this ability to innovate and accelerate the market for all participants. So I'm going to close with a quick demonstration, if we can get the technology to work. Um, and I'm going to show you the Linux micro platform actually running on a uh, RISC-V emulator. I'm going to show you an over-the-air update of the operating system using uh, industry standard software, uh, OS tree, which is what you find in uh, commercial enterprise distributions. And it's a single source, source code base that delivers IoT and edge functionality on x86, ARM, and RISC-V ISAs. As I said, I can't show you Docker yet, but, but I can show you this. And I'm going to do it on QAMU for, for ease. Uh, it's also available if you want to play with this um, on Sci-Fi Unleashed. Um, but you can do exactly what I'm going to show you at home on your PC if you want to. So let's see if I can make this work. Can we switch to the presenter? So you should be able to see um, a window here of, of my laptop, and what I have here um, is, hopefully that's big enough for you to see, um, is a couple of files. One is a Linux image, a .img uh, file, um, and the other is some firmware to get things started, and if I show you this, whoops, uh, this is the command that's used to actually start up QEMU and load the firmware and image, and this is the um, Linux micro platform that I talked about earlier, so we're going to start this off. So this is Stop the auto boot. Let's try that again. So this is going to auto boot. So this is booting Linux on um, the Risk V QEMU. Takes a little while, and it's starting up all of the services and processes. Um, and this is a networked implementation. 
So once it's finished, it will come up with a login prompt, setting the system time which we need, and setting up the terminals, and starting the login service. So this is now running um, Linux kernel and user space. And oh, it's resizing the root file system to fit the available disk space, starting the network manager um, and the over the air client. And it's now um, started and we have a login. So I'm going to log in. And notice that the version of the platform is 649. Um, I can do a U name, minus A. So it's QMU RISC B 64 bit, RISC 5 64 GNU Linux. Um, and I can also show you, um, let's see, do OS tree admin. Uh, status. So what this is showing, let's just send that to a file, uh, status, uh, what should we call it, status 649. So what this is doing is showing you that this is running the LMP, this is the image that we created. What I'm now going to do, this will actually automatically update in a, a when it nets notices, when it calls back to the server. But to accelerate this demo, I'm going to do this by hand and restart the um, daemon to actually go and look for the update. So what I've done here is restarted Actualizer, which would have happened triggered in the next five minutes anyway. And what you should see shortly is what is happening um, in the background is that the, uh, there is a new version of the uh, Linux micro platform that's available now um, since, we, since I loaded this uh, a few days ago. And if all goes well, it's actually connecting to the internet, pulling down that update over the air, and it's then going to reboot. Um, I will warn you there's a, there's a bug in the um, QEMU code somewhere, which means that the reboot crashes. There it goes. It's loaded the update and it's now going to restart automatically and it will crash because there's a problem in QMU. So that's fine. We'll, we'll, let it, um, we'll let it crash and then I'm going to show you, reboot it again um, and show you, the, um, show you the updated version, we hope. And so what I'm doing here is essentially taking a Linux kernel and then I'm going to basically demonstrate the fact that over the air, we've actually, in real time, we've updated this to a newer version. And if we want to, we could go back. So let's come out of this and notice that I have my image. What I'm going to do, the changes have been made to this image, so I'm going to run this image exactly the same way I did last time. And so we're going to do this command again, and we're going to reboot. Um, which would normally have, have happened automatically when I hit reboot, obviously. So what's happening now is we're taking the same image and notice that now the version number has gone up to 667. And just we'll let it finish and I'll show you that has really happened. Um, and then I'm done in about two minutes. So this is uh, reloading the operating system again. Interestingly, if you do an over-the-air update of the applications in containers, you don't actually have to reboot at all because the containers are, are loaded, the container daemon is, is, docker is restarted, and you can actually run the applications, an updated application, without actually rebooting the, the operating system. But in this case, because we've changed the uh, we've changed the the root file system because we don't have Docker yet, we have to do a reboot. 
Okay, so now we're back logging. Notice that it's 667. If I now log into this again, oh, whoops, help if I type, then if I do, um, let's see, the same command as last time, sudo os tree admin status. So what you see here is we now have two implement, two versions. Uh, we have the current new version that's running, which is version 667, and then we have the old version, which is available for rollback. If, for example, the new version had failed, there would be an automatic rollback to the previous version so that you don't brick your expensive server or device. Um, so we now have two versions. We're running the latest. Um, with all the latest security patches, and all of this is available today for Respite. This is exactly the same software as we use on ARM and also on x86. So, um, and just to show you, there's the status 649 file that we created earlier, um, and that is the one that is the original build, and it has the same SHA as that rollback build there. So what I've demonstrated to you is not only Linux running on a risk five chip, but also over the air updating it. Pretty cool. Um, okay, so if I go back and stop showing screen, uh, change presenter. Uh, is it going to go back to my slide? Just show my last slide, which I think is my goodbye slide. Thank you. <laughs> All right, there we go. Thanks very much, everybody. I'm happy to answer a couple of questions, but I uh, want to get on to the next speaker as well. So, anybody got any questions? Yes. I wholeheartedly agree with you that we should turn both the stream to present the software presentation. But if I understand correctly, the GNU tools don't think they're accepting patches for custom instructions. Should we be lobbying to change that? So, the difficulty with upstream quite correctly is the reason not to accept um, upstream commits for custom instructions generally is that effectively, you're, if, you, if you try and get support upstream for everybody's custom instructions, the compiler is going to turn into a mess. This goes back to the comment I made about uh, AI and, and machine learning. We have to, as an industry, work out what to do with custom instructions. And maybe it needs some form of abstraction that says, there are these classes of instructions that we can create an abstraction layer on that needs to find in, so that at boot time, the architecture can say, here, is, here are the hardware capabilities I have from this known set of custom instructions. Today, I, you can put customized instructions in, but you have to provide your own tools. Um, and that's why I think ARM have been very careful about this and said, here's a bunch of tools. And by the way, if you are going to do this, Strong recommendation: Don't recompile the kernel and the, and the operating system. Just do it. Just do it in libraries that, that only know about your instructions. This is going to be an ongoing issue in the industry um, and in the upstream communities, and it's going to take time to resolve. So I don't have any good answers other than yes, if you want to get to market quickly, you have to go and create your own stuff but you are creating a lot of technical debt along the way, so be careful what you wish for and think about this. Any more questions? Thank you. Oh, no, it's okay. Okay, thanks. Do you want this to use this? Yeah, right. Next speaker, of course, is Morton. Or Eastman. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so just a brief disclaimer, I just exported it from Google Slides, so hopefully there's no uh, Google Slides. 
Uh, yeah, my name is Morten. I'm here to talk about uh, RIPES, which is a project of mine uh, that I've worked on for now two or three years. Uh, in brief, what RIPES is, is an application uh, that simulates a five stage risk fire pipeline, which can be used for teaching some of the concepts uh, taught during an introductory course on computer architecture. And um, it was sort of born out of my uh, frustrations with some of the teaching methods uh, that are right now for teaching this kind of stuff, and uh, then I came right. Uh, I'm first going to talk briefly about some of the topics which may be covered during such an introductory course in computer architecture, sort of as motivation for why tools like this may be nice to have. And then after that, we're going to do a, a short dive into the application, we're going to see some of its capabilities, and, uh, and also do a little demo. Okay, so when you first get introduced to computer architecture at university, these are usually the things you would go through. You would learn about assembly level programming, you would learn about instruction set architectures, so the difference between a risk and a system instruction set. You would get introduced to x86 uh, because it's there, uh, but mainly you would focus on a, a risk instruction set. Uh, previously that has focused on MIPS and ARM, but now as uh, I say risk five is sort of uh, getting up to speed. Uh, more universities are actually starting to switch over to this. Then you would also get introduced to microarchitecture. So what is a processor? Uh, initially, what is a single cycle processor? So just to learn the basic components. And then we move on to, uh, say, more advanced uh, implementations such as pipeline processors. And uh, caches are also introduced. And maybe some system design, most processor architecture interconnects and all these kinds of so in terms of what RIPES uh, tries to target and help with is uh, these three things. Uh, so RIPES can help with uh, learning assembly level programming in risk uh, learning the instruction set itself, and also teaching about a pipeline uh, architecture. Okay, so uh, entering one of these uh, courses, it's expected that the, the students at this point, they know how to code. Uh, so they would be able to write a function in C, but it might be the first time that they're actually exposed to the underlying architecture. So uh, this is the first time they see a scary assembly level code, uh, and then they have to actually learn what does it mean to work directly with registers. Maybe they have to manage their own stack and all of these kinds of things. So usually you would get assignments where you have to write small algorithms uh, in assembly just to get familiar. And once you're familiar with an instruction set, you may move on to microarchitecture. So at this point, you sort of open up the, the black box that is the CPU and actually get a look into uh, how does my instructions uh, execute on a given architecture and what are the implications for executing my, my code. So you, you start to figure out that, okay, there's a program count, I have ALUs and um, yeah, all of the things that actually make up the processor. So this is gradually getting more and more into what is a computer and what is the architecture of, of a computer. But pretty quickly, you also move on to figuring out that most processors nowadays are not these uh, idealized single cycle uh, processors. Um, and it, you may already know this, but it's basically because of the critical path in the circuit. And that is the longest path which a signal has to travel through the circuit, which basically uh, really limits the, the rate at which we can plot our circuit. So that is the main motivation for pipelining our processors. We, it's taught that we take basically the same components uh, and then we slap some registers in between them. And uh, at this point, fair enough, we can we have a much uh, shorter critical path, which also means that we can clock our circuit at a higher rate. So this is pretty quickly where our course would go to and say, okay, we are now working with pipeline architectures. But pipelining is not free. Uh, so I wrote here with pipeline and com hazards. Uh, and we mainly work with two different kinds of hazards, uh, control hazards and data hazards. I'm just briefly going to show them here. Uh, for instance, this is a control hazard. Let's say we take the branch here, we would take the branch. Uh, but the thing is when we're actually deciding on uh, to take the branch, we may already have the highlighted instruction here in our pipeline. And so it wouldn't be semantically valid to actually execute that instruction. So we must flush that instruction from the pipeline. So that's a control hazard. Now, there might also be data hazards. So in this case here, 
the oops, yeah, that was a <laughs> exporter. There should say a, a zero and a zero here. So the second instruction there uh, has a dependency on the first instruction, and basically what it means is that the operands of the second instruction uh, are computed by the first instruction. But when the second instruction actually needs these operands, uh, the result may not yet have been written back to the register file from the first instruction. And so we have to figure out a way to resolve that uh, hazard. And to, this is what's called forwarding, to, to take uh, uh, operands from one place to, from the pipeline to the other, uh, sort of bypassing the register file. Uh, but the main point here is how is this visualized? Uh, because this is this is what's taught during the course, and uh, so there's uh, two main methods of visualizing. Uh, we have uh, the multi uh, multi flux cycle diagram and the single flux cycle diagram. And for both of these, it's kind of a time versus data path resolution trade-off. And uh, we're going to see two examples here, one for each, where we're going to investigate the code written over there. Okay, so uh, in this case, this is the uh, the multi clock cycle diagram. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, our rows are instructions and the columns will be uh, clock times. Uh, and then inside each cell, we have a notion of which instruction is in which stage of our pipeline. Um, what we can show here easily is, for instance, pipeline stalling. So we have a dependency between these two instructions here. And that means that the second one here, we have to wait. Uh, wait for executing an instruction until the dependency has been resolved. So, indicating stalls. <coughs> we can also indicate forwarding, as I talked about earlier, where we take an operand from one stage and feed it uh, to a stage that's earlier in our pipeline. Um, that's usually indicated by an arrow. And then we can also uh, visualize uh, flushes, which is when we have to remove an instruction from our power line because we shouldn't execute it. So this is a good idea for figuring out the execution of the program, but you don't really get any data path information. So you don't know how the multiplexers in your design are actually selecting signals. You don't know when uh, specific uh, interstate registers are being clocked or not. And uh, to sort of uh, mitigate this, we have the single clock cycle diagram. So this is basically a slice uh, of your data path where you just view a single cycle uh, in your program. Uh, then it's pretty common to write the names of the instructions above the, uh, the stage names and to visualize, for instance, uh, if we flushed, for instance, we would just draw a, a dotted line or something or write new one in there. Uh, so this perfectly shows the usage of our data path. It just uh, matters about how much stuff we put into it and what we want to visualize. But it's it's really nice for, let's say, if you want to highlight that there's forwarding from one stage to another, we could draw that on this slide. Uh, sorry, the, the diagram, or we could, I mean, there's a lot of freedom here to actually visualize the, the data path. So this is the one I prefer the most for, for getting an insight into what's happening underneath. But the, the issue is that this is also this has to be done in books, right? Um, and so for this particular program, it would take seven uh, figures to actually represent the full execution, uh, which is a lot of book real estate. And uh, especially if you uh, want to change some parameters of the program, then you would have to do a full new sequence of images. But it's still nice. I mean, you get a view of what's happening in the, the data path, and you can get some more feeling of it. But um, so this is the main motivation for RIPES. Uh, what if we can get sort of this uh, this view of a, a program execution, but just dynamically. So you can write any program, and then you can just execute it as you normally would, and then you can see the, the state of the data path changing while you're executing it. So what is RIPES? It's a visual simulator, I call it. Uh, of a five stage uh, pipeline, uh, implement the describe instruction set, and it also implements forwarding and uh, has a detection. The, the usual stuff that you would see uh, like in the middle to an end of one of these courses. Uh, right now, it supports the RISC 5 uh, 32 INM instruction sets. It has uh, an integrated assembly editor and uh, assembler as well. We're going to see that in a minute. And also, sort of an interactive memory viewer, so you can easily get an overview of what is the contents of our memory. 
a brief slide about how it works. So it's written in C++ uh, using the Qt framework. Uh, so it works for all the major platforms. Um, there's a very sort of thin framework for modeling synchronous and uh, combinational logic to allow us to describe the, the actual uh, simul simulator. And uh, then the basic simulator is, is written just as uh, any HDL process, uh, any processor would be described in an HDL language like the HDL. And then on top of that, we have sort of a graphical component. So for the things we want to visualize, we can define a component for that, and then we link it with the underlying simulator component. And then all changes in the simulator will be reflected up to the graphical uh, interface uh, to the user. This is a list of some of the universities who, as far as I know, have switched to teaching RISC-V and uh, then also using the simulator. Uh, and there's also others. So it's nice to see that there's a, a, a real adoption of this. Um, yeah. And it's spread nicely over, uh, over the world. So we have Brazil uh, represented, Denmark is my home university, and uh, some American campuses as well. Okay. So that was uh, the brief introduction to why tools like this may be uh, uh, needed. When you boot up RIPES, this is the first thing you're going to see. This is the view of the processor. Um, there may be a lot of stuff going on here, but this is a quite simplified view, actually. And there's things like the control logic and the hazard detection units, which aren't even drawn. Here. So um, but the main points are drawn here, for instance, the multiplexes, which would decide where in the pipeline we would uh, forward operands from uh, uh, drawn. And um, for instance, if we're actually forwarding something, the uh, red dot here in a multiplexer would change its position depending on which signal we're actually getting. Um, then we also have stuff like, uh, so you can see the memories here, the data memory. If we are writing or reading to the data memory in a different cycle, we would just change the, the colors of the write and read it's called them LEDs from red to green. Um, also, we, we do the same thing since the diagram, we draw the instruction that's currently in a pipeline stage above uh, the stage. And if we, for instance, need to flush a stall uh, during execution, we will draw this as a no op and then write the reason for the uh, stall or flush uh, afterwards. Uh, yeah, so this, this is uh, the view which you will get, and this is what's kind of animated. Uh, while we're executing, that's what we're going to see in a minute. Then we're just going to go through some of the capabilities of it. So this is the processor tab, which is also on the first slide. Uh, up here, you just have some basic simulator control. You can step your simulator. You can just run your program, and then it will break on a, on a breakpoint. Um, and now here, you have a view of your architectural registers. You can select the, the, the display type, if you want assigned or hexadecimal. Um, and down here we have a view of the current in, uh, instructions that's loaded into the simulator. Um, also, what's interesting here is that we get a notion of which instruction is in which stage. And this can be quite useful if, uh, for instance, you have an instruction that is in multiple stages at a given time. So that may be a bit difficult to see in the actual pipeline view here, but you will see it down here. Um, and then down here, we have sort of an application output console. If you use one of the environment calls and you print the console, then it will pop up down here. And also in the corner here, there are two bars for cycle count and number of instructions executed, which are also quite important metrics in a, in a pipeline architecture. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Then you can also place uh, this uh, display all signal values. So all values. Uh, which uh, have an underlying simulator component will be displayed here, and those will be updated as you're actually executing the simulator. So you can see the entire state of your uh, your uh, data path while you're actually executing. Next up, this is the uh, the editor. So there's an integrated assembly editor with syntax highlighting for the RISC-V instruction set. Um, what's nice about this is that it does sort of a continuous uh, assembly. So when you write something here and there's no syntax errors, then it will immediately assemble the program um, and show it over here on the right side. So why do we have this? Well, what you see here is a disassembled view of the assembled binary. Uh, and the main reason for this is to also teach that even though this is assembly language, it's sort of still abstracted a bit. So we can use pseudo instructions, 
you can refer to labels and stuff. But the, the view that we get over here on the right will be the actual binary uh, disassembly. That. And you can also set breakpoints here, which will be loaded into the simulator. Then when you execute, they will just break once this is in the uh, fetch stage. All right, and then on to the memory view. So first of all, we have sort of this big memory uh, block here. Uh, this is your memory starting from 0x0 all the way up to uh, the full 32-bit atom space. You can just scroll through it with your mouse uh, and you can also navigate. You see you have this go-to bar here and then you can navigate to the text segments or the top of stack uh, or your heap uh, to sort of quickly navigate your program. You can also select your uh, display types. So maybe you have assembled uh, a string into your memory and you'd rather see these bytes here represented as uh, ASCII characters. So that's also an option. Then you have sort of a list of the memory axes which were performed during execution. Uh, so this is nice to sort of view, let's say you have stack frame which moves, then you want to actually go investigate what was written uh, into your memory. So you can just click an axis and then it will go straight to the address uh, here to the right. And then you also have a view of your registers here. All right, so that's the basic uh, functionality of, uh, of Bribes. So I'm going to go to an example here uh, of how one may use this to actually get an insight into what's happening in, in such a data path. So let's take a, a factorial function. Uh, initially, you go from, from writing it to C, in C and then compiling it. Also, if you want to do it, you can do it straight in the assembly code. Uh, but once you have your assembly code, you need to do some stuff to actually make it executable in the simulator. So uh, the assembler in RIPES needs a notion of where to put the different uh, segments of the, uh, of the program you're about to assemble. Uh, so in this case, we need to tell it that our instructions need to go in the text segment and the static data here should go in the uh, data segment. So that's pretty simple to, to set up. Next up, we need to define an entry point and also an exit point uh, for the simulator. So the simulator is set up to start executing from address 0x0. Zero zero. So the first instruction in the .txt segment should be our entry point to the program. So this is also pretty easy to set up. We just initially here, we load the argument from our data segment into a register, and then we jump to our factorial function. Uh, and then at some point, I will also do a return call, and then we will jump to this end label. Now, in this case, I've placed an end label at the end of the program. And this is uh, just a sort of a shorthand way of telling the simulator uh, to stop, because once our program counter will exceed the size of the, 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 the binary that's loaded uh, into the simulator, then uh, it will stop execution. Uh, you can also like call a specific e-call function, uh, which signals to the simulator that, that it should stop. So this should be all the work that's required to take a respired uh, program that was compiled to a compiler and then actually execute it on the simulator. Uh, here you see it inserted into the, uh, the, the editor tab. And here on the right, you also have the binary view. So this should also be nice if you're sitting with your uh, RISC-V uh, instruction set documentation and actually want to check uh, these are my instructions. Is it the same as I see in, in these many tables, which I'm sure you've seen with the of the risk five instruction set. Um, and then we can go on to the memory tab as well. So remember that we assembled a, an argument into our static data segment. Well, you can go to the, the data segment here. And in this case, it just starts at 0x1 a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's a 7 where we expect it to be. Uh, so that's good. And we're ready to start executing the simulator. So at this point, I had a video here, but I'm not sure whether it will play if I do this. It will, cool. All right, so I'm going to show a, an execution of this uh, program here. Uh, the video is a little bit fast, so we don't uh, try to follow all the things, but just uh, take notice in that we're actually seeing a lot of different uh, state changes in the, in the data path. So here we press start, and then the program will basically just start executing. We see all of the different values change uh, during execution. Um, also, if you look at uh, A1 here, the register A1, you see that uh, the factorial value is slowly getting calculated. And then we will end 
at, I think I have it here. We will then end at, with a value of 5040, which is the factorial value of seven. All right, now what's also worth noting is uh, this down here. So that's the cycle count and the number of instructions executed. So uh, this is not similar, and uh, this is not the same, which it shouldn't be either, because during execution of our program, we're sometimes sorting, we're sometimes flushing our pipeline, and that's basically wasted cycles. And this is also quite an important metric that's uh, being uh, emphasized during, uh, when, when you learn about computer architecture, that these things will only be the same in the say, uh, single cycle uh, implementation. So that's basically how you would use write to write any program you think of and then see how does it actually execute on a on real hardware, but uh, visually and in a time scale which you're actually able to follow. <coughs> then some future work. Uh, a lot of people are starting to use this and I've also gotten a lot of requests for new features. Uh, maybe they have single cycle simulated uh, single cycle processor because that's where we start. So that could also be nice if you start executing that. Maybe then move on to a three stage and then a five stage with possibly no forwarding. So in these cases, we would have to do scheduling ourselves and insert no ops uh, into our program to actually uh, schedule it ourselves and avoid dependencies. Maybe different branch behavior. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be done here. Uh, but basically, it could transform into sort of a full companion for these courses to to go from no knowledge of computer architecture to knowledge of a pipeline architecture with forwarding and all this stuff. But it could probably also go further. So let's say you want to simulate some more advanced topics, maybe out of order processors. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that could be visualized in such a case. Maybe caches. So in this case, we don't really need to visualize the CPU, but in terms of caches, we could visualize uh, eviction policies, uh, associativity levels in the caches, and so forth. And um, possibly also things like brain prediction. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of topics inside the computer architecture which could benefit from being taught with a more sort of visual counterpart. Uh, because this is, it is inherently dynamic when we execute a processor, and yeah, that could be visualized. All right, so that was basically it. Uh, right, on GitHub, uh, fully open source, and there's also pre compiled binaries. Uh, so you can just go and download it and try it out. Um, and this is some other great tools here for teaching, if that's interesting to you. So Compiler Explorer, it's kind of getting a lot of fame nowadays, but uh, very nice for investigating uh, and trying out different compilers in a uh, super easy way. And uh, then there's another risk five uh, simulator here. And then there's some contact info. Yeah, questions? So there's an MS uh, System very well before, but had a pipeline very similar to the one that is already in Rice. Mm -hmm. Would it be a lot worse to try to, uh, and if I could make a dump out any information that has the direct state, but I want to, would it be a lot of work to change the model, the C model that's currently in Rice, or a model for, for that parallel to mm -hmm. uh, Right now, yes. Okay. So um, Rice was written very much as sort of a work in progress. Uh, and I'm working on another framework right now, which takes a lot of the uh, the lessons learned from Rives and, and does it right from the beginning to do exactly what you uh, mentioned here, to, to be a lot more modular and yeah, to allow uh, new uh, different implementations super easily into the, to the program. So right now, no, but but it is definitely something that's on the way. Uh, and maybe also, I mean, right now, that framework takes a custom description of circuit other options could be to uh, to write some uh, like for barely uh, do something on top of the after there maybe use system C and uh, to choose these designs it's already in C plus plus so extend that so there's a lot of options but right now <laughs> exactly do you see yourself addressing those feature requests for like a single stage or three stage or five stage all those ones is that is your long term plan to address all those features definitely features definitely yeah but it, it's all a matter of time. And, uh, and then I, I have studies on the side as well, so that's a, that's a very good. But definitely. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Martin.